Okay, it's 10.05. We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in for our Woodland Wildflowers program. The education staff at Nahant Marsh is working really hard to bring you a lot more of these webinars in the near future. So stay tuned to our social media pages and our website to learn more about when those are. Um, if you have not visited Nahant Marsh before, if you're just tuning in to learn more about us, um, we are a 305 acre nature preserve in Davenport, Iowa on the west end, close to the I-280 bridge. We offer education programs uh, during our normal operating times. We have an education center that offers public and school group programs. Um, Right now, because the education center is closed, we still have our trails open. We have around three miles of trails that are open from sunrise to sunset. So I encourage you to get out there and do some social distance hiking and do some nice bird watching. We've got plenty to look at there and plenty to explore even while the education center is closed. So um, with that, I will go ahead and let Allison get started. Um, just some housekeeping things to uh, keep in mind. If you uh, want to ask a question, go ahead and either ask it in the chat below or in the Q&A section below, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. Um, you should all be muted right now, so we are going to hold questions until the end. And we will record this so that you can view it later if you missed anything. So I will go ahead and let Allison start. All right, thank you, Cassie. Um, so my name is Allison Noderft. I am one of the full-time AmeriCorps naturalists here at Nahant. Um, I started back in about August, and um, I started this journey into teaching environmental science about a year ago. And one of the classes I took was local flora, and I kind of fell in love with woodland flowers. So um, I'm gonna show you some of our favorites. Um, I kind of took a poll throughout the month Marsh, and um, these are kind of our favorites that we came up with. So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, how do you tell the difference between some of these flowers? Because I have an example below, and um, we'll see the difference. We'll see um, how to tell the difference. So one thing you can look at is leaf shape. So um, is it lobed? Is it dissected? What does that leaf actually look like? And then what type of leaf is it? Is it a simple leaf? Is it a polymate leaf? Is it a compound leaf? All these things are going to be keys to identifying um, different plants and different trees. Then you're going to look at the leaf arrangement. So how are the leaves actually attached to the stem? Are they opposite? Are they alternate? Are they kind of irregular and everywhere? Or are they whirled? From the leaves, you're gonna look at the, um, the flowers. You're gonna look at what the actual colored flower part is. So what color is it? What shape is it? How is it clustered? Is it a spike sticking up? Is it one solitary flower? So all these things are really, really helpful when you're identifying different um, flowers. So right here, I have a really good example. If you were walking along a trail and you saw all these two flowers, you might think from a glance that they're two different or they're the same thing. Um, these are actually two different flowers. The one on the left is a yellow buttercup and the one on the right is a downy yellow violet. So if you look really closely at the buttercup leaves, it actually has three little leaflets within that one leaf. And then if you look at the violet leaf, there's that characteristic heart-shaped violet um, leaf that all violets have. All right, so we're gonna talk about um, some plants that have bloomed, um, some that are currently blooming that I've went out and um, seen in the last couple days. And um, I have a few kind of fun facts about some of these plants that we'll talk about some uses for them. So let's get started. All right, our first plant is bloodroot. So bloodroot is a really cool little plant. Um, it blooms from March through May. And um, it gets the name bloodroot because the stem will ooze um, bright red juice when it's cut or broken. And then that juice will rapidly coagulate. Um, I, that can't juice rapidly I can't listen to her upstairs because she's, oh. you know. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. <laughs> All right, sorry, Amy wasn't muted. Okay, um, so this stem will, when it's cut, 
that oozing juice will actually coagulate. So it's kind of like blood. Um, it's really, really special if you get to see a uh, blood root plant bloom because it only blooms for one day. So after it blooms, you can see um, on the left, our flower that is bloomed has the leaf tightly wrapped around it. After it blooms, that uh, leaf will unfold and it's a really unique shaped leaf that you guys can see um, throughout the forest floor. They get really, really big. I actually just saw one the other day that was like probably nine inches long. And then um, our last picture is an actual picture of the root and you can see how it kind of looks like it bled and then it coagulated. Um, so the root of this plant is actually poisonous. Um, some Native Americans would use the root to make a tea for things like stomach cramps and um, to help with burns. However, this practice was um, kind of discouraged because of its poisonous characteristics. And then um, another name for this plant is red Indian paint because Indians and Native Americans would use this to um, dye anything. They would use it for war paint, they would use it to dye clothes and all kinds of things like that. All right, our next plant is tooth fort. Um, this is a very small little plant that grows in kind of colonies on the forest floor. It blooms from March to May um, and it has two types of leaves that are very similar. If you look at these two pictures, the leaves are kind of different. Um, the, the, the difference in the leaves is how they're attached to the plant, but they look very similar. Um, it has very small droopy little white flowers. I actually think those flowers kind of look like teeth themselves but the name toothwort actually comes from the fact that that little root that they're holding there um, looks like a tooth. And then, so what will happen is several of these little roots will um, grow in the ground and it will create that little colony. They'll connect with roots, the little tubers will. And you can see how there's lots of leaves in that picture that are the toothwort leaves that have kind of made their little home. Um, the tubers can be used in stews and soups with meat and other dishes, and they can be eaten raw and they kind of take like, taste like a radish. All right, so our next one is Virginia bluebells. Now, um, this one is a really spectacular one to see. It will cover hillsides. Um, we were just at the Fairmont Cemetery and one of the hillsides was completely blue. Um, it will bloom March through May. There are still some blooming. I have seen them at um, Sunderbrook blooming. Um, it's a very fragile flower. It has a very fragile stem and the flowers attached are very fragile. So if it's close to a trail, sometimes you'll see it kind of trampled. Um, one way you can identify it without um, the flowers is the stem is covered in little tiny soft hairs. So a trumpet shaped blue flower emerges that nods towards the ground. And then if you look, it's got these little pink nutlets that are about an eighth inch across. And um, four of those little nutlets will be produced per flower. Another name for Virginia bluebells um, was lungwort. And this came from the fact that when Europeans came over, it was very similar to a plant that they had in Europe and they thought they could use it for lung issues, but they were actually unsuccessful with that. So this is one of my favorites to see. Like I said, it will kind of take over and you'll see this just blanket of blue. It's really pretty spectacular to see. All right, Dutchman's Breeches. Um, this one will bloom April through May. Um, this was kind of my first introduction into woodland flowers. This was the first one we saw blooming in class and it was pretty special spectacular to see the hillside at Wildcat Den just full of these Dutchman's breeches. Um, so it has fern-like leaves as you can see. Um, they're kind of bluish green, sometimes gray, so these leaves will really stand out amongst the other green in the uh, forest floor. And then a leafless stalk arches high up um, above the leaves and it carries four to ten flowers hanging in a one-sided cluster. Um, these little white flowers actually look like breeches, so that's where it gets its name. It's also called little boy breeches, Indian breeches. It's got a couple different names, but all the names come from that little flower that looks like a pair of pants hanging upside down. And then um, there are little elongated seed capsule, which is that little um, yellow thing you can see contains 20 tiny crested seeds. Um, this was used by early pioneers to treat urinary problems. The roots are poisonous um, 
and it is closely related to a plant that I'm sure a lot of you have seen in a garden called the bleeding heart. All right, bellwort is another one that is blooming like crazy everywhere right now. Um, it blooms April to June. It's a very droopy looking plant. It's kind of, once you see it, it's kind of hard to miss because it's just, it's very droopy. The flowers are droopy. They don't really ever open. Um, it just looks, it looks kind of sad. Um, early settlers would um, cook the upper stems and leaves as greens. Young shoots can be eaten um, and served like asparagus. And then the roots can also be used as food. Um, it can be made into like a tea to treat upset stomach. It can treat wounds and skin, skin inflammation. And then um, the roots can also be concocted into something to use for canker sores. All right, so our next one is the dog tooth violet. Um, I actually learned this plant as the white trout lily, and that's normally what I refer to it as. Um, this is a really special plant. It, um, it doesn't bloom um, right away like most plants. So this one will bloom April through June. It has a pair of thick lance-shaped leaves that are smooth and almost shiny. So you can kind of see, you'll see the forest floor covered and these leaves will be, they kind of shine and they're really, they're kind of easy to pick out. Um, so for the first two or three years, only a tiny single leaf is produced. The next two or three years, two larger leaves are produced. And then after that, two leaves are formed. And a plant may not flower till it's six or seven years old. So it's pretty special if you can find a patch that has flowering plants in it because those plants have been there for six years and they haven't been trampled or disturbed in any way. Um, so they have a deeply rooted bulb system which will turn it into a patch. So you'll see a patch of all of these little tiny leaves that are purple and green spotted throughout the forest floor and they're usually there are a lot of times on hillsides and you'll you'll be able to pick those leaves out. Um, the flower is white with a tinge of pink and it has a yellow center. Um, the bulbs were food for many Native American tribes. Um, they can be eaten raw, boiled, or roasted. And their flavor, flavor is crisp, clean, and somewhat sweet. So this is one of my favorites to see. Like I said, it's really special if you get to see one actually blooming. All right. The next one is probably my favorite. Um, Jack in the Pulpit is a really cool little plant. I get really excited when I see these because um, they're just, they're so distinct. And there's kind of a couple different um, varieties of them and colors of them. So the Jack in the Pulpit will bloom April to June. Um, it has very distinctive foliage. So as you can see in the far right, um, it has one or two leaves leaves made up of three pointed oval leaflets. So we've got that top one that's kind of bigger and then underneath of it you can look down at the bottom and there's another set of those three leaflets. And these leaves can get to be up to seven inches long so they can get to be pretty massive and um, you'll kind of see them sticking up and they're they stick out really really well on the forest floor. And then a separate a separate stalk carries a club-like spadix. So that's the um, the little thing you can see sticking up in the middle and that's what is referred to as jack or the preacher. And then a green leaf-like spathe wraps around the spadix and that forms the pulpit. So this far left picture you can see it really well where there's this um, spathe and the spadix in the middle and then the spathe wrapping around it. Um, these plants can be striped purple and green like the one we have. It can be all green or I've even seen them where they're um, very bright purple underneath that leaf. Um, so these are another one that have a deep rooted bulb um, like base and this it grows like a turnip shaped corm and then this acts as their storehouse so they can grow early in the spring. So these are one of the first ones you'll see kind of popping up. And um, if you look at this picture on the left hand side, you can see how the leaves are kind of wrapped around to start with. So that jack in the pulpit will pop up and then its leaves will pop up um, next to it. Indians use this plant to treat things like sore eyes, headaches, snake bite, ringworm, asthma, and other disorders. This, um, this really unique plant was really used a lot and it um, has a lot of good characteristics to it. Um, however, 
One of its bad characteristics is the root contains a high concentration of calcium oxalate. So it can be poisonous, um, but you can make it edible by making it into a flour. So you will boil it, you peel it, you make it into a powder, and then you heat it up again. Kind of sounds like a lot of work for flour. Um, so some Native Americans would use this plant kind of in a mischievous way. They would um, take the fresh root and they would add it to cooked meat and they would leave that meat out somewhere and hope that their enemies would come by and um, eat that meat. And then they would become poisoned by a calcium oxalate overdose. So they were kind of sneaky with their, with their uh, jack in the pulpits. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about some things that you guys can go out and look for. Some plants that are going to be blooming that um, you guys can go out and easily find and see if you can positively ID them. So our first one is the mayapple. Um, the mayapple is a pretty recognizable plant. It's got that big umbrella on top and you'll see bunches of these along the forest floor. So a mayapple doesn't actually bloom until it becomes a mature mayapple. And what happens when it becomes mature is it will then have two leaves on top. And from that Y comes out that little bud and then you get the little bloom of the little white and yellow flower. Um, our next one is the shooting star and this will bloom from April to June. Um, our director at the marsh said he's actually seen some of these start to bloom. Um, they grow in small clusters and they're nodding looking little stars. So the plant looks like a star, but it's facing down towards the ground. The center of the flower is yellow with a dark circle where the yellow, um, yellow center joins the pink petals. So this is really a spectacular one to see um, and it's gonna start popping up everywhere. All right, Solomon seal. So this is a tricky one. There's actually a false Solomon seal and there's a true Solomon seal. Um, we're gonna talk about the true Solomon seal and I will tell you the difference between the two. Um, so this one will flower March through June. You can actually see the leaves now um, popping up all over the floor um, along trails and things. Um, the non-branch stem with leaves that are alternate and have thick horizontal lines. So you'll see them when you're walking down the trail and you can really tell by those really thick veins and really thick lines along the leaves that this is an actual um, plant and it's an actual wildflower, it's not just a weed. Um, so the yellow green flowers are about half inch long and they hang in the cluster from the leaf axis um, where the leaf meets the stem. And then it will actually form berries that are black and they will appear to be the size of a pea. So like I said, there's also a false Solomon seal. So the leaves and the stem look exactly the same. Um, the difference is it will have a tall, white, feathery looking plant that will shoot up from the top of the leaves and the berries on this plant are actually a bright red. All right, another one to start looking for is columbine. So this one will bloom April through June. It has three little leaflets, and then it has these distinctive scarlet red and yellow nodding flowers. Um, it also has a, um, a little bulb in it that has nectar in it for uh, bees and such, and this is really, this is a really cool one to see blooming. All right, so we're walking along the trail and we're, it's just all green. How in the heck do we see all of these, all of these plants in this sea of green and this sea of garlic mustard? Um, I look for the different. I look for the thing that doesn't belong. Um, I look for the, the weird looking leaf and um, I, I try to ID it. A lot of times it can be a weed, it can be, you know, garlic mustard it can be something that is not really cool but sometimes you'll find something that's really uh, pretty fun I did this one time and I found a green dragon it was the only one I've ever seen and um, I got really really excited about it so looking at this picture you can see there's bluebells in it you can see the bright blue um, if you look closer between the two logs you can see there's two jack in the pulpits starting to pop up but if you look above those jack in the pulpits, you can see those leaves that kind of don't fit. 
they're kind of a different color. So those are actually trout lily leaves. Um, so once you, once you kind of have an idea of what some of these wildflowers look like and you know what you're looking for, once you start walking down a trail, all you'll be able to see is the wildflowers. You won't see the garlic mustard. You won't see the, um, all the other things that you don't want to see. You'll just see these plants. All right, so we found a really cool plant. What do we do now? We got to figure out what it is, right? So um, these are a couple books. There are tons of them. Um, these are kind of my favorite. These are the ones that I've used. So the um, Wildflowers of Iowa Woodlands is the book that I use for this entire presentation. That's where I got all my information. I like this book because it's actually written by a Moline um, original. Sylvan Runkle wrote this book. It has amazing pictures in it. It has amazing descriptions. It has all of those cool little fun facts that um, I think help a person remember the plant a little bit easier. Um, our middle book is the Peterson Field Guide to Wildflowers. This is the book that I used in my local flora class. I will warn you, it has every wildflower in it. Um, it's a little overwhelming. They're sorted by colors, but it has really good information in it. So once you can get, you know, narrowed down, okay, it's a, this color flower, you can figure out from there, it has really good descriptions of what they are. And then if you want to go super lightweight, you want to be a minimalist, um, um, you want something to throw in your bag and you don't want to carry around a big bulky field guide, the Iowa Trees and Wildlife um, Folding Pocket Guide is a great guide. Every state has one. There's an Illinois one, there's a Wisconsin one, and it's just basically, it's the size of a map. It unfolds. It's got all of the common um, wildflowers and trees that you're going to come across. But in the age that we live in, there's an app for that. So iNaturalist is a really cool app that you can download on your phone. I have it downloaded on my iPad and um, you can basically just take a picture of something and it's pretty accurate. It will um, tell you what you're seeing. I do recommend that um, with all things that are technology, they're not always 100% reliable. So if you think you found some super rare wildflower and it's telling you that it's, you know, a pink turtle head, you might want to double check that with your um, with your guidebook. So we're gonna I'm gonna kind of go through how to use this because this app um, there's a lot to it. So we're gonna go through it. So this is my um, this is my iNaturalist on my phone. These are the couple plants that I've looked up here recently. And so uh, up in the left hand corner, there's these three little lines. We're gonna click on those three little lines, and that's gonna take me to our menu bar. So our menu bar has um, explore, it has projects, it has guides, it has all kinds of things. You can change your profile. Um, we're gonna explore and we're gonna see what we can find. So once you hit explore, it's going to take you to all of the things that people are seeing and all of the things that people are finding in your area. As you can see by this picture, it will do more than just plants. It will do birds, it will do mushrooms. Um, about the only thing I haven't found it will ID is rocks. Um, it doesn't know the difference between any of the rocks, but it's usually, it's pretty accurate. So it's a pretty cool tool to download. All right, so we found something super cool. What do we do now? We have a couple choices. Um, we can take a photo of it right in the field and we can submit it and we can go through it. If you're like me and you have hundreds of pictures of plants on your phone and you forget what it is, you can do choose photo and it will go to your photo gallery and you can ID your plant that way. So once we've selected our photo, it's gonna put it in up there and you're gonna click, what did you see? That's gonna take you to this next screen and it's gonna show you, it's gonna give you options. It's gonna say, we're pretty sure it's this genus. And then it's gonna give you um, your top 10 options of what it is. So I know this is the leaves from an anemone, so we're just gonna go with that one. And from there, it's gonna take you over to another screen where you can compare um, this anemone to other ones. So you can try to see, is it a yellow anemone? Is it a wood anemone? Is it a Canada anemone? And it has a description below, so you can look at you know, the difference in the leaves, the difference in the flower color, those little subtle differences that are gonna help you find um, what plant this is. So once you've decided, all right, it's this one, you're gonna click select. 
And that's gonna take you back to that first screen you were on, but you've got your picture. Now you've got what your plant was. Um, you can add some notes. So if there's like a reason you saw, if you saw it in a certain place, um, if you wanna remember that this specific anemone has purple spots on its leaves, you can type that in here. It will do the date of where you found it or the date of when you uploaded it and your location. Um, I will caution that you can change the location of, so you can make it so the visibility is closed. So if you find something and you don't want people on your land coming to see this plant, you can change that um, visibility so people don't know where you found this. So we're all satisfied that with this. We're gonna hit the check mark up at the top and it's gonna load it into my observations. And then you have observed a anemone and logged it in your iNaturalist and you now are a plant expert. So there it is right there. All right, so does anybody have any questions? Um, you can type them into the chat box and Cassie will relay them to me. I'll give bonus points if anybody knows where this picture was taken. Okay, it does look like we have at least a couple questions. Um, Jen asked, does the iNaturalist app cost anything? The iNaturalist app, app is 100% free. Um, it's kind of one of those citizen science based apps. So um, you don't have to pay for it. You just download it and it works really, really well. We use it a lot. Okay. Let's see, Michelle's guessing that the picture is a marsh. Is that correct? It is not a marsh. It is a form of a prairie. Okay. Um, Oh, someone wants to explain garlic mustard. Um, what, do they want to know anything specific about garlic mustard? Um, just can you just say what it is? They're not familiar with so, it. Um, garlic mustard is an invasive plant. It's actually, um, it's edible. And you'll see it all over the forest floor. It's got kind of these um, kind of roundish leaves and it will stick straight up. So it forms a stalk that goes straight up and the leaves are alternate around that stalk. And then it will have a, um, a yellow flower that looks almost like a little clover flower um, on top of it. And it spreads really, really well, like, like wildfire um, over a forest floor. And um, it's, it's not a great plant. It will take over and it will um, crowd out other native flower, flowers because it is one of those first bloomers because it shoots up so fast. Okay, um, Carrie said, we are trying to restore our small wooded area. Is there any place where we can buy seeds or bulbs for these flowers? Um, so Prairie Moon is a good one for prairie flowers. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if there's a good seed place that has woodland seeds. Um, I will get that information, and when I send out an email with this presentation, I will include that for you. Okay, uh, Michelle asked, can Virginia bluebells be transferred? Are they spreaders? Both. Um, there is a certain type of year that you can dig them up. Um, we were talking about it the other day. We don't actually know when that type of, when that time of year is, but you can dig them up and then they will, they spread out along hillsides. Okay, uh, Connie is guessing that this picture is the less hills. Nope, she's close, but nope. Okay. It is uh, a hill. Arnie's guessing a riffra? I'm nope. Not sure. Okay. Um, Gail asked, I have a lot of Solomon seal. Is it edible and does it have medicinal uses? Um, that's a great question. And I left my book downstairs. Um, most guides will tell you if plants are edible or not. Um, like I said, that Woodland Flowers of Iowa um, has all that information in it. Um, I can also include that in the email. I'll include if it's medicinal and edible for you. Okay, uh, Tina asked, where is a good place to hike and see the flowers? All right, great question. I was hoping someone was gonna ask that. Um, so Fairmont Cemetery, I know this sounds really weird, but Fairmont Cemetery has beautiful wildflowers and um, really great birding. 
Um, Sunderbrook Park in Davenport has really good wildflowers. Um, you have to go up past the main part and get away from all the garlic mustard. Um, Schutzen, which is off of Waverly and Davenport. Um, if you're farther away, um, Loud Thunder in Illinois, Wildcat Den um, in Muscatine County, and a really good place that I have not been to since I learned what all these wildflowers are is Mississippi Palisades in Savannah, Illinois. Those are a few of my favorites and the ones that I know for sure have really good wildflowers. Okay, Curtis is guessing that the photo is a Sand Hill Prairie near Muscatine. Curtis is correct. I think Curtis cheated. He, he already knew. <laughs> Okay, does anyone have any other questions? Feel free to type them either in the question and answer, the Q&A button, or if you uh, type them in the chat, we'll see them there too. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. Oh, we got one more. Uh, let's see, what was the name of the cemetery? Fairmont Cemetery. It's in Davenport. Um, it's actually about two minutes from Nahant Marsh. It uh, looks like Tina's wondering if maybe in, if you, when you send out the email, if you could list the places that um, you could. Yeah, I will, I will for sure do that. Um, oh, Michelle asked, which wildflowers are found at the marsh? So um, there's not a lot of woodland flowers found at the marsh right now. Um, there's some violets and things like that. Um, we'll have cardinal flower occasionally, but um, we mostly have prairie. And since our woodland floods as much as it does, we don't usually tend to find a lot of woodland flowers here. Okay, hey, Constance is asking where you can buy Sylvan Runkle's book, Woodland Flowers of Iowa. Um, you can buy it from Larry Stone. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it from Barnes and Noble. Um, I would I would definitely recommend it. There's also a prairie version and a like marsh plant version of the book. So he actually has three of them um, that you can purchase. Okay, uh, Carrie's asking the best way to get rid of garlic mustard. <laughs> um, so the thing about garlic mustard is the seeds are in that little seed head and they spread really, really easily. So what you have to do is you have to actually completely pull the entire plant out. Then you're gonna wanna bag it and um, you're gonna wanna take it and get rid of it that way. Don't um, just think that you can pull it out and drop it on the ground because when you drop it on the ground, those seeds are still viable and they'll regrow. So pull it, bag it and get rid of it. Okay, hey, any other questions? All right, Allison, do you have any closing remarks? Um, I just wanna say thanks to everyone for uh, tuning in and listening. And um, I hope you get out there and I hope you find some really cool wildflowers. And I hope you download the iNaturalist app and um, hope you see some cool stuff out there, guys. Yep. Thank you all for attending and don't forget to visit the marsh. Our trails are still open.